Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today, I have kind of a follow-up video to one of my most popular videos, which was breaking down all the different types of data models um, that exist out there for building really well-structured data warehouses. And today, I want to kind of take it out of the specific models and really talk about some overarching best practices that you want to use when you're designing your data models. So understanding what data model is best and then within the context of your data modeling workflow, what are some steps that are universally applicable no matter what type of data model you're going for? Obviously, there will be some kind of specific tips for specific types of data models and some caveats, but in general, I want this to be a video for anyone that's you know, starting their data modeling journey. Come here, understand what the best practices are, what are some things you should implement, so you have a clear guideline set for how you should build your data models. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. And so on the first thing I want to talk about, and also something that is definitely universally applicable no matter what type of data model you end up going with, is understanding the business model and the business requirements behind that data modeling exercise. So before we even start getting into all the technical aspects of data modeling, it's really crucial to have a deep understanding of those business requirements that that data model is going to be driving rather than just focusing on, hey, how do I make the most efficient data model possible? Because if it's a really efficient data model that doesn't have a really, that doesn't line up well with the actual business need of the data model, you might get fired. Um, and so that data model really at all steps should be designed to support the specific needs of the business. So maybe optimizing in some areas and, and forgoing optimization in others that might not, that the organization might not need. Um, and so being able to do this really requires an understanding of the types of data that are gonna be stored the relationships between different data entities um, and you know different sources of data, and also how that data will be used. Who are the stakeholders? Where is the data eventually going to end up down the line? Um, and so, two real ways, or you know, actionable ways, you can kind of start this process is number one, engaging with stakeholders. Collaborate with your different business stakeholders to gather requirements and ensure that your data model aligns with your business objectives. And then secondly, use case analysis. Make sure you're identifying the most common queries, the most common reports that that data model needs to support, and then work backwards and think, okay, what data model needs to, what does the structure of this data need to be to support these common queries and reports in a really efficient way? And this will help you in structuring the model to optimize performance for these scenarios, rather than just optimizing performance for some kind of broad generalization. Now, the next thing you're probably gonna wanna do uh, before you really start, you know, getting into the nitty gritty and actually implementing a data model is creating a conceptual model. Make a more abstract representation of the data with kind of more human interactions like, hey, if I'm a customer, I, am pro I can be an attendee, and an attendee can be a customer that interacts with the stadium, that organizes an event um, that I, as an attendee, bought a ticket for. Um, and so through this, you can kind of develop the high level relationships that you then want to replicate within the data model and just focus on the main entities and those relationships without worrying about the specifics of how that data will be stored. Um, and so this is what's referred to as an entity relationship diagram to where you visually represent the entities, the attributes of the entities. So if there's other information about a customer you might want to collect, maybe recording that. So a customer is of a certain state, is of a certain age range, um, and just really help clarify the overall structure and identify potential issues that might come up later where, hey, you know, maybe an attendee can buy a ticket, a season pass to the stadium that gives them access to every event and identify, hey, where could those potential, you know, tough areas come by, uh, come up when, before you actually start really implementing everything. And also, in this step, avoid overcomplication. So that example I gave where, hey, maybe, you know, an attendee can uh, get a season ticket. Maybe you don't bother overcomplicating this data model and you actually create a separate data model for season ticket holders that's focused on that element. Or maybe that just isn't a core element of your business domain because you know, you're just worried about the ticket attendance. Um, in the stadiums, you're actually going to many different stadiums and the revenue all looks to you the same. Um, so this is just a great starting point for really planning everything out and making sure you have a good framework before you get too deep into any one area. Now, the next thing you want to think about as you develop your data model is the process of normalization. Now, normalization at a high level is just the process of organizing data within a database to reduce redundancy and improve data integrity. And so what this means in practice is taking larger tables 
uh, and breaking them down into smaller related tables and defining the relationships between them. And so at its most basic level, that's gonna look something like this, where you have you know, your uh, one bulk table that has all the information in it and breaking it down into two different subtables. And so within that, what I had in the screen before, is you actually want to have these three normal forms. And so what these normal forms are, are basically a series of processes that you can guide to think, how do I break down these tables and make them as atomic as possible so that I can define those really specific relationships between the different components that make up your data. Um, and first, you have first normal form, where is ensuring that each column is containing atomic values and there's no repeating groups. So that any group that repeats within the within those columns, so if you know two columns have the same information or like multiple different entries that are all for the subject of English with different values for them, that's something you would want to break up and have a table for you know just the people that were part of that English group. So if there's any kind of field that you're seeing over and over again, think about creating a table for that particular field and the attributes linked to it. The second normal form is eliminating partial dependencies where you have non-key attributes that depend on part of a composite key. Um, and that means that you have, you know, let's say a customer ID and a purchase ID that both link to a, or, you know, item ID that you bought linked to an account, uh, linked to a purchase ID. Now you'd want to break that up into a customer ID that is assigned to a purchase ID and then that purchase ID links to a separate table that contains the items that were purchased within that purchase ID rather than having a table that contains the purchase ID and or the item ID and the customer ID uh, linking back to that. So again, breaking it down, making sure you don't have duplicate data. And then the fine level, final level is the third normal form where you remove transitive dependencies. So that means having non-key attribute, no, or ha removing any instances of non-key attributes depending on other non-key attributes. So that means there should be no relationship between data points within your tables other than the primary key foreign key linkage that defines the relationship between those two different tables. So again, just making sure that everything is broken up into its respective components and no data is repeated. And so here you can see another example of a relatively well normalized uh, database where you have, this is a only really to the second uh, form, not to the third form, because you still have some of these composite keys, which you don't want to have. Now, while denormalization or normalization is important, it's not also for every single use case. Sometimes you actually will want to denormalize your data. Um, and there's a few different reasons on why you would want to choose one or the other. Um, so high level, while normalization is really crucial for reducing redundancy and not storing duplicate data, Sometimes denormalization can be beneficial for improving performance because even though you might be storing more copies of that data, those copies to access might require fewer queries, you know, if it's all in one table, rather than you need to query through several different tables. Um, and so denormalization involves combining those tables or duplicating data to reduce the number of joins required for common queries. So pretty much the exact opposite of what you just saw where you have one large table that gets split into many small tables. And here you can see kind of a simplified example of that where you have, you know, your normalized data where that data is split into two different tables and denormalize where member and visit uh, are all within the same table there. And it's really going to be, a, you know, kind of a process to identify which one is best for you. You're going to want, when you're looking at, hey, first thing about normalizing your data, get it normalized as much as you can, but then also go identify performance bottlenecks from running that when you're testing it. And if certain queries are really slow to excessive joins and need to combine those tables to get you that end result data, consider denormalizing the data model in those specific areas to make those queries faster. Um, and then make sure you're using this process selectively. Denormalization isn't something that you're gonna to wanna to use all the time. It should be used judiciously because it can lead to re data redundancy and potential inconsistencies if you're not properly updating the data across all the different locations in which it's stored. Now, the next thing you're going to want to think about considering is indexing. Indexes are popularly used to speed up the retrieval of data by providing really quick access to rows in a database table. But improper indexing can lead to performance degradation during those kind of during write operations if you do it wrong, uh, because it'll just add additional bloat to when you want to bring data. Um, if you don't have a good, efficient way to assign indexes, then you're just gonna be signing a ton of indexes that may not actually be needed. Um, and so 
First thing you want to do when you're thinking about indexing is identify key columns where, you know, this is index columns that are frequently used in where clauses, join operations, order by clauses, um, and then take those key columns and then those are the columns you likely want to index on because those operations will get the most value out of having indexes on them. Then you're also going to want to think about balancing between read and write performance. So while indexes improve read performance, they also can slow down insert, update, and delete operations. So ensure that your indexes that are chosen have an optimal balance between your reading and writing performance. Then third, use composite indexes. For queries that involve multiple columns, or you know, if you know that every query it's going to be using multiple different primary keys or, you know, not primary, or, yeah, maybe primary keys, but many columns have, you know, similar importance in terms of how to, how they're going to be able to find those specific rows and preserve that information to that query. Using composite indexes that include all of those relevant columns and apply one index that then references multiple columns uh, can be super useful as well. You can kind of see an example of that in this uh, here where you have multiple columns um, and indexes. Now, the next thing you want to think about is designing for scalability. So as your data volumes grow, data models should be able to scale to accommodate increased loads without significant performance degradation. And there's a few different ways that you can design your data models in your database to account for this. The first is horizontal partitioning. So in this example, by different types of service, um, where you're distributing data across multiple different databases or servers, to help handle large volumes of data and improve performance. So you know that someone, when they're looking for an order service, they don't need to access these other four uh, tables. They're just going to query the data that's in that order service table. So really reducing the cost of that query. Then you also have vertical partitioning where you split a table into multiple tables where each table contains fewer columns. And this is where, you know, within one of these, you know, databases that you're seeing here, you split your tables and to say, hey, every thousand uh, entrants create a new table where each table uh, then, or vertically, um, where each table is assigned to just a specific column within that subject area. Um, and then you can help optimize access patterns for those specific queries because they just need to access the columns, you know, a sh shorter subset of columns within that table or they only need to query you know, that shorter index that you know, from zero to a thousand rather than going you know, zero to 10,000. Um, then this is where you're also going to want to think about your provider, make sure you're using a distributed database provider. Um, and you know, this honestly most database providers these days, um, but just have one that has high availability and scalability across multiple nodes. So you can actually implement this with your database provider. Now, the next thing you want to think about is designing for data integrity and data consistency, which is really, I think of data as data quality. Um, and so maintaining both data integrity and consistency is really crucial for obviously making sure that your data is accurate and reliable. And so this is where you're going to want to think about, hey, use constraints to enforce data integrity at the database level. Um, make sure you have primary keys, foreign keys. Every entrant has to have a primary key and foreign key, unique keys check constraints. So make sure you know, you're know you constantly checking your data, making sure it conforms to the model that you defined so that you can be sure that, you know, in this example, nothing will change a piece of data. You know, it comes into your database. You have full visibility and full confirmation that a piece of data goes through those series of manipulations or broken down into its different components and then put in the proper format where everything is related using those primary keys, foreign keys, and, and unique keys as well. Additionally, you might want to think about implementing transactions. So transactions you can use to ensure that a series of operations either all succeed or all fail. So if any single part of that upload process, you know, when that data is being ingested, fails, the whole operation fails. And that helps maintain data consistency because instead of having, you know, kind of like a shard of, of partially processed data, if only a single piece of that data uh, fails, that entire entry is going to fail and you'll be alerted rather than, you know, just that kind of half filled out piece of data being uploaded in your database and potentially screwing up your data model. And then finally, to make sure you're designing your model to avoid anomalies like insertion, deletion, and update anomalies. These are just common things that happen you know, within databases. 
these can corrupt data integrity. So make sure you're designing with that in mind um, and make sure you're not falling into some of those pit traps. And you can just quick Google like what those uh, causes are. Now, the re next recommendation I have for you is document everything. Documentation is often very overlooked uh, in this industry, but it's really essential for ensuring that your data model can be easily understood and then maintained over time. Um, and what I mean by this is, you know, things like ERDs, so entity relationship diagram, any type of diagram, keep them up to date with the latest version of the data model. Make sure those are living, breathing documents uh, that are easily accessible to all team members. So even if I don't, you know, have the technical knowledge to get in the weeds and understand the primary keys and foreign keys, I can at least look at an ERD diagram and say, all right, so this is generally what the database looks like. These are the relationships within the different data entities and having a high level understanding of how the, our, my data is stored and how I can access it. Um, also, another great idea is creating a data dictionary. So create a data dictionary that provides detailed descriptions of every attribute, every entity, every relationship with the model. So there's a single you know, repository that can tell you all the information you need to know about how all your data is related, and then also keep that up to date. Um, and then finally, version controlling can be really useful for data models and keeping that documentation and kind of you know, a STLC best practice format where you're keeping track of changes. You know, if, for instance, you try to push a change to a data model, you can revert back to a previously stable version if suddenly that breaks a bunch of queries and doesn't work at all. So you have this kind of record that you can refer back to, you know, if you make some breaking changes, kind of easily revert back to, hey, this is the previous working version. And then kind of in keeping with that topic, also, last recommendation is to constantly have an eye on iterating and refining on your data models. Data modeling is not a one-time activity. It requires continuous iteration and refinement as business requirements evolve and new use cases emerge. So regularly reviewing performance, monitoring the performance of the database, refining the model as needed to address any issues is super important to maintaining high performance and making sure your model is adapting to changing business needs. And then also incorporate feedback. Gather feedback from users, developers, identify pain points, areas for improvement, and really keep an eye on the end user and because that's at the end of the day, the only person you need to be developing for. Um, and then finally, always remain open and adaptable to new technologies or databases that could help improve your data model or help your particular use case. Um, and that is all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this kind of follow video and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data Guy out.